Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all of you here in Missouri and all those who are watching over the web. Today is 12-12-12. All of you numerologists must be having a very special day. And uh, somebody did a little analysis here, maybe it was Jackie, uh, to figure out just how often will that happen, where we have a date like that and it's also a Wednesday afternoon lecture. Well, of course, we aren't going to have any more dates like that for the rest of this century, because once you get past 2012, well, you're into those dates that don't have months that go that high. So this is the last of the NNN dates. But actually, we won't have another Wednesday afternoon lecture that's like this until April the 4th, 2204. Because the others that happen before that don't happen to be Wednesdays, except for one that's Veterans Day, and we probably won't have a lecture that day. So live it up, people. This is a special time. And I guess, yeah, for all of us have a little tinge of the idiot savant, this is a good time to think about those things, speaking of myself. Well, that was a silly comment, uh, a more serious comment. That this is a special day and a special lecture, because uh, today at the Wednesday afternoon lecture, we have the annual Margaret Pittman lecture, which has been, as you can read in your program, uh, something that's been in place for quite a few years with a number of very distinguished presenters, including today, uh, and set, established in 1994 uh, to honor uh, Dr. Margaret Pittman, who was NIH's first female lab chief and who made significant contributions to bacteriology and vaccine development, was the person who figured out that Haemophilus influenzae type B was the major cause of um, infantile meningitis, something which now, happily, we have a vaccine for, and a wide variety of other contributions that she made uh, at Rockefeller and then here in the area of vaccine development for such things as pertussis and tetanus uh, in a long career uh, here at NIAID. So we honor Margaret Pittman uh, today uh, by remembering her in this lecture, and we always seek to identify a lecturer who represents that tradition of excellence and who's also been particularly importantly involved in mentoring, mentoring especially women scientists uh, who have contributed to our field. And Jennifer Grandis, our speaker today, uh, very much uh, represents that tradition, and we're delighted to have her with us. Uh, she uh, did her undergraduate work at Swarthmore College. Uh, I notice a joint uh, major in biology and art history, so this is a Renaissance person. <clears throat> Got her MD at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and remained at the University of Pittsburgh to this day uh, in a remarkable career, carrying her through uh, to training in surgery and otolaryngology. Uh, from there to assistant professor, associate professor, and by 2004, full professor, and now distinguished professor in the Department of Otolaryngology, as well as assistant vice chancellor for research program integration in health sciences. She's received a number of distinguished awards. I have to mention the Provost Award for Excellence in Mentoring, and that she's a, ment a member of the Institute of Medicine. Uh, she has, uh, to her credit, uh, and we should express our gratitude, uh, been very uh, gracious in extending service to NIH. Uh, she has been on lots of study sections. Uh, I think some five, uh, three pages of her CV goes through this, and we do uh, really appreciate that kind of hard work, including being a member at the moment of the Board of Scientific Counselors uh, for NIDCR and the recipient of numerous NIH grants. Her work has been consistently uh, focused especially on cancer of the head and neck. And any of you who are involved in clinical care will know that these are some of the most difficult and frustrating uh, illnesses uh, to wrestle with because of the fact that these in general have lacked an effective treatment, that they affect a part of the body often involving swallowing and speech uh, that makes it particularly challenging uh, for patient and physician uh, to figure out the appropriate management. But she has contributed to this uh, in very substantial ways to carry the understanding of these diseases into the molecular era. And she will be telling us about that today, I'm sure talking about EGFR and a variety of other pathways. The title of her lecture is Targeting Oncogenic Pathways in Head and Neck Cancer. She's going to speak, we'll have time for Q&A, and then there will be a reception in the library with uh, refreshments. 
uh, which you're all invited to come to as well. But I think I should get out of the way and ask all of you to help me welcome Dr. Jennifer Grandis, the Margaret Pittman Lecture for today. Please welcome Dr. Grandis. Well, thank you. It is so wonderful to be here. I'm honored to have been invited to deliver this lecture. And I'd like to start by really thanking the NIH for being so supportive of me and my career. It's a really atypical woman who chooses a career in surgery and then chooses a focus on science. And most people feel that's a bit of an oxymoron. And I have to say that support from the intramural and extramural program through collaborations and um, invitations to participate in the review process and to help um, design programs has been invaluable to my career development, and I'm most grateful. Thank you. I'd like to take you on a little bit of a journey today and really emphasize the bi-directional dynamics of translational cancer research. And as a person who is trained primarily as a clinician, it's been really difficult to do anything but translational research, although now I guess it's a quite popular buzzword. And for those of you who aren't intimately familiar with head and neck cancer, I'd like to just briefly describe my uh, chosen disease focus and then emphasize that all of the principles that we'll discuss in more detail are really applicable to virtually every malignancy and potentially lots of other disease processes. So until recently, we really believed that most of the cancers in the head and neck were associated with exposure to tobacco and alcohol. Increasingly, there's an epidemic of human papillomavirus-associated head and neck cancer, primarily in North America, but I'll tell you that's because we're testing for it here. So I've recently been to India and China in the last couple of years. They deny having any HPV head and neck cancer, but if you ask them if they've looked for it, the answer is no. <laughs> so it's really hard to know what to make of that um, assessment. Still today, the treatment is we cut it out and deliver adjuvant and non-selective cytotoxic therapy, right, like radiation or radiation plus chemotherapy, or when cutting it out is just too morbid to imagine in terms of loss of function, we delivered combined chemoradiotherapy. Chemotherapy by itself is still not particularly active in head and neck cancer. Even when we cure a patient of their initial cancer, there's a very high rate of recurrence and second primary tumor formation. So the statistic that really illustrates the morbidity is that if a patient survives their first head and neck cancer, they will usually succumb to a second cancer of the aerodigestive tract. And despite tremendous efforts in the field, most extensively Ki Hong's work on retinoids, the only effective chemo prevention strategy thus far is to stop smoking. So hopefully work by the interim program here led by Silvio Gutkin and others will introduce much more effective agents for prevention of head and neck cancer. So these are the anatomic sites. This is a sagittal MRI. I'm primarily not going to focus on uh, sinonasal or nasopharynx, which is chiefly found in uh, southern uh, Asian populations and associated with the Epstein-Barr virus, but focus on the oral cavity, pharynx, and larynx. Now, if you lived in Europe and you wanted to buy a carton of cigarettes, this is what they would sell you. And in our good government's wisdom, this is uh, not allowed because it infringes on the freedom of the uh, tobacco companies. But this was thought to be a potential deterrent to smoking in Europe. However, there's a cottage industry, I understand, of very nice looking uh, holders. <laughs> so you can buy a package of cigarettes that looks like this, and you can put it in something very pretty so you don't have to remind yourself that this is what will happen to you if you continue to smoke. So from my perspective, the gaps in knowledge that have really driven our program over the years is we still have absolutely no idea what to measure in a patient's tumor to tell us how best to treat the patient. So there's no predictive biomarkers. We don't really understand treatment resistance. It's not very well defined. Therefore, we can't really elucidate the resistance mechanisms. Even though we understand that HPV is a very different cancer, and I'll show you some data about that, we still don't have any HPV selective therapies. I suspect that one day if we would vaccinate all of our children, we might not have HPV associated head and neck cancer, but that is clearly decades from now. I'll tell you a little story about how our genomics is revealing new targets, new pathways, and new ideas about how we can really design um, innovation, innovate, innovative and more effective uh, trials. But I think the real challenge is to elucidate these groups among the tremendous genetic heterogeneity with the understanding that many of our subgroups are going to be small but quite meaningful. 
So I think before we undertook uh, genomics, this was uh, just a sample signaling trial with a sample of some of the agents that are under clinical development. And you can see it's most of the usual suspects. There are uh, receptor kinases, non-receptor kinases, and downstream signaling pathways, and many agents that have been developed to block different components of this pathway. But I think of this era as a little bit of playing with the dark, because essentially we developed hypotheses, we interrogated cell lines and human tissues, but only in the context of really validating our selective hypotheses. So Dr. Collins is right. I'll start with the EGF receptor, which is what I started working on many years ago. And as, as most of you in the room know, it's a growth factor receptor. It's overexpressed in many cancers, certainly in head and neck cancer. It's really not mutated in head and neck cancer. I'll tell you a little of a story of uh, variant three, which we don't think is an alteration at the genomic level. And it's the only validated molecular target. And what I mean by that is the uh, FDA approved a tuximab for the use of head and neck cancer patients in 2006. So now it's in our clinical armamentarium, but we really have no idea who is best treated with cetuximab. There are no predictive biomarkers. So this was the uh, New England Journal paper that changed the world. It was the first new drug in nearly 50 years. But it's been disappointing, and it's been disappointing because we really don't know precisely what it's doing in the tumor. Again, we don't know who should get it. We don't have positive data with the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. In fact, the only phase three trial with gefitinib was negative. And disappointingly, ASCO last year, there was a report of the definitive trial of chemoradiation plus cetuximab versus chemoradiation alone, and the, ke the addition of cetuximab to chemoradiation was not substantial in terms of improving survival. So we simply have lacked models to be able to test for cetuximab response and resistance. So, so to that effect, a really smart graduate student took a book from the Herceptin playbook, and we realized that virtually every cell line that we grew in animals and that made xenografts was exquisitely sensitive to cetuximab, so it clearly did not mimic the diversity of human head and neck cancer. So we grew some cells over time in tumors as xenografts, and we selected out for two models that developed resistance. So this is a model of acquired cetuximab resistance, and you can see down here that these are the tumors that grew over time. We demonstrated we could take them out of the animals, and we could propagate them and put them back in. And curiously, what we found, and this was potentially interesting and something that I'm not sure we could do anything about it yet clinically, is that we found that there was a fragment of HER2, a cytolytic cleave fragment called C11CTF that had been reported in the context of receptin-resistant breast cancer. And this fragment appeared to be increased in the setting of resistance to cetuximab. And then when we took these cells, that these tumors that were now resistant to cetuximab, and we treated them with a dual EGFR HER2 kinase inhibitor, efatinib, which is an irreversible small molecule, either alone or in combination with cetuximab, we could get enhanced treatment responses. And this drug is now in clinical development development through ECOG uh, being led by Christine Chung at Johns Hopkins. The other uh, altered form of the EGF receptor that we noted was the variant 3. This was discovered in the context of glioblastoma uh, by Daryl Bigner and others, and clearly it lacks most of the uh, ligand binding domain of uh, EGF receptors. So we reasoned that cells that express variant 3 would be less likely to respond to cetuximab. So to that effect, we developed a model of head and neck cancer. We now have several of these, and I'm happy to share them, where we uh, made tumors that express the variant 3. So one of the dirty little secrets of variant 3 work is that any tumor that has variant 3 will not grow as a tissue culture. So all of the V3 models in every organ system are engineered, which is a real challenge. We're hoping to overcome that with heterotopic xenografts. But in any case, I think one can appreciate that when we treat these tumors with cetuximab, they're relatively resistant compared to the vector control. But this was just an experimental observation. So it was quite reassuring, again, the bi-directional nature of translational research when a group from Germany noted that in a phase two cetuximab docetaxel trial, that expression of variant 3 and the EGFR autocrine ligand amphoregulin were independently associated with resistance to this regimen, lending some sort of credence to the idea that if we could prospectively identify patients who have variant 3 in their tumors, these would be individuals who potentially would not be responsive to cetuximab and could potentially benefit from differential treatment, potentially at a HER2 inhibitor. 
So how do you block variant three? It's a little challenging. So um, Ira Paston here has developed an immunotoxin, his, the PE38, linked to a moiety that blocks to uh, uh, variant three specifically. There's an antibody that was developed by Lloyd Old, subsequently at the Ludwig, and now through Abbott, 806, and it blocks both wild type and variant three, and this is in clinical development. And for reasons that aren't very well understood, work from Kwok Wong at the Farber in lung cancer models has shown Shown that these irreversible EGFR HER2 inhibitors tend to be effective against variant 3. So that's another potential place where a predictive biomarker variant 3 can indicate uh, a likelihood of response to these agents. So as you noticed on the first slide of signaling pathways, STAT3 is a very common downstream pathway. And I'd like to tell the story of how we got to STAT3. Rick Klausner, when he was head of NCI, came to visit Pittsburgh, and we presented our data to him, and we were talking about autocrine growth through EGF receptor and subsequent activation of STAT3. And he said, well, wouldn't you just want to block STAT3, just go downstream? And we're like, well, yeah, but isn't that kind of challenging as a transcription factor? And what really persuaded us that this was worth doing is when we put STAT3 into uh, head and neck cancers, they became resistant to EGFR targeting. So we reasoned that this was a, 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 a an approach worth investigating. And then work by Bernie Weissman and others have shown that phosphorylated STAT3 levels in primarily tongue cancers were poor prognostic uh, indicators. But let me tell you, this is an undruggable target. You know, thinking, and this is only put up to emphasize how incredibly challenging it is to block a transcription factor. So I'll tell you a little bit of a story. We elected to follow um, uh, the playbook of uh, Victor Zhao and try oligodeoxynucleotides and make them into decoy oligonucleotides. Nucleotides. So frankly, what Victor Zhao had done in cardiovascular disease um, was he had developed an E2F decoy and he was using it in the clinic at the time we got into this to uh, uh, prevent intimal hyperplasia. So cardiovascular bypass grafts were ex vivo, bathed in a solution of an E2F decoy and then put back into the patients. The phase two results were really promising. And I will tell you, cut to the chase, the phase three trial was negative. But I will tell you a little bit of a story of how we've done it with STAT3. So in addition, though, to trying um, uh, this uh, decoy approach and uh, lots of natural products, which all kind of work a little bit, but I think we can all agree that these natural products, Google, Sterone, Curcumin, Hanakiol, have many other targets, and they're not really selective for any particular molecule, including STAT3. So in a collaboration uh, uh, with the NCI uh, through the NEXT program, we've had a really um, exciting run for the last uh, 18 months or so. We developed a high content imaging assay in collaboration with Paul Johnston in the Drug Discovery Institute in, in Pittsburgh. And the fundamental issue is that STAT3 and STAT1 have a lot of homology but STAT1 has a more of a tumor suppressor function, and we don't want to block STAT1. STAT3 has much more of an oncogenic function, and virtually all of the drugs that are STAT3 inhibitors, including the JAK inhibitors, block STAT1 and STAT3. So in an, in an attempt to find a STAT3 selective molecule, Paul designed a high-throughput, high-content imaging assay that would differentiate between IL-6-induced STAT3 tyrosine phosphorylation nuclear translocation and interferon-induced STAT1 tyrosine phosphorylation and nuclear translocation. So we screened 100,000 compounds, and initially we have uh, four leads. Uh, we've gotten down to probably two of these compounds, and all of these compounds potently inhibit uh, STAT3. They do not, for the most part, inhibit STAT1, and they all potently inhibit head and neck cancer growth in vitro. This is four different cell lines. And so we've got some really exciting preliminary evidence. It's probably a little bit too early to present about the mechanism of action of a couple of these compounds compounds, this one and this one in particular, that might lead us to select them. But we're working with teams of chemists and teams here at the NCI to really try to develop a small molecule that is not a kinase inhibitor. These are not working by inhibiting uh, JAKs uh, to humans. So give us about a year. Um, this is our decoy. And what we showed early on is that this double-stranded piece of DNA was uh, dose-dependent, incorporated into the cells without lipid carrier. It works in the cytoplasm by binding to STAT3 dimers. It also works in the nucleus. And so potentially, um, what we could do first in animals was easy, and that is we could inject the decoy into the tumor. And Z, I think this is an experiment that you did. So Sichuan Z, when he was in my lab, oh, maybe 10 years ago, <laughs> did these experiments and published this paper. And when uh, Z injected these tumors with the STAT3 decoy, they were growth 
growth inhibited, tremendous amount of apoptosis in contrast to mutant control decoy that differs by a single base pair, doesn't bind STAT3, had virtually no effect. And it was very reassuring when John D. Giovanni, then at MD Anderson, took the same decoy in his mouse model of skin cancer and could show uh, that the, the skin cancer was prevented uh, largely by injection of the lesions that developed with this decoy. So we thought that there was some hope for it. And again, the only perk of being a surgeon and a scientist is you can go right to the clinic. So this is what we did. Uh, around this time, the FDA um, developed the concept of a phase zero trial. They thought this would be a suitable scenario since it was a first in human STAT3 inhibitor study. So we took patients who were having resection of their head and neck cancer, and we took them to the operating room. We biopsied them. So that's pre. And then we injected the decoy, and we did the operation, and then we took out the tumor, and we harvested a specimen uh, in the region of injection um, after the surgery. And this was about four hours, it was the mean time. And you can see that most of the patients demonstrated down regulation of STAT3 target gene expression in the post-treatment specimen compared to the pre-treatment specimen. So we were pretty excited about this. And then a very wise grant reviewer said, hmm, what about hypoxia? What about surgery? How on earth do you know that this is specific for the decoy? So we then convinced our IRB that we needed a control group in a phase zero trial and we uh, treated half the patients with saline and half the patients with the decoy and found that in general, the decoy-treated group had greater down regulation of target gene expression compared to the saline group, and this was about 15 patients in each group, and this was great, except we had to inject this into the, into the tumor. And we knew from working with uh, uh, Richard Caprioli's group at Vanderbilt that our half-life of this uh, just phosphorothioate modified decoy was only about an hour. It was totally impractical for systemic administration. So we engaged a very talented chemist at Carnegie Mellon University, which is down the block, and with this chemist, we, we experimented with lots of modifications, and the goal was to stabilize the molecule without losing biological potency. So we found that if we made it cyclic, and this is just two carbon spaces on each end retaining the same sequence in the middle, we could retain the ability through SPR. We showed that this uh, modified decoy, including the cyclic decoy, was still able to bind very avidly to STAT3, so it could retain its biological potency, but we had a dramatic increase in half-life, so we're now up to 12 hours. So now it becomes more representative of a drug, and it also has a much um, a lower, a much higher melting temperature um, of uh, 80 degrees, so it's really unlikely to fall apart when injected into the bloodstream. And then we did the key experiment, which is we put uh, tumors into mice and treated them with intravenous injection of either the cyclic STAT3 decoy or the cyclic mutant control, and the decoy-treated tumors failed to grow, the control-treated groomers grew, and there was significant down-regulation of target genes, in this case cyclin D1 and BCLXL, in the cyclic-treated tumors, and again, this was um, IV treatment, so no direct injection. And uh, we published this paper just a little while ago, but this is a couple months ago. This is what the decoy looks like. And uh, where we're taking this is we're finishing farm tox studies in uh, animal models. And it's interesting. It looks like the only thing that the decoy did to the mice at very high concentrations of IV injection was make them a little hyper excitable, but that was temporary. Um, and in addition, we're collaborating with a cardiologist and we've put the decoy into a micro bubble. And the idea is that we'll be able to deliver this micro bubble encapsulated decoy to the head and neck region via ultrasound application. And so far, it's working in the animal model, and Lisa Villanueva has a new R01 uh, funded through NHLBI in order to develop this. And lastly, we're collaborating with a um, engineer who's engineered a sustained release microparticle. And our idea is that in the uh, surgical setting post resection, that we irrigate the wound with the decoy in these microparticles, which can be engineered so that they have sustained release kinetics over the period period of a year or two, and that might be a reasonable way to prevent a recurrence. So we're exploring different ideas. But we still have absolutely no idea how STAT3 is activated in human cancers. It still remain really challenging because it's undruggable, and we don't really know which patients would benefit from a STAT3 inhibitor. So 
just when we thought we kind of understood head and neck cancer biology, we were able to engage um, uh, several investigators at the Broad, Levi Garraway, Todd Golub, and the team, of course, was led by Eric Lander to sequence head and neck tumors. And so at the end of the day, we sequenced 74 head and neck tumors for whole exome analysis, and we published this. And here is the finding that this was a typical head and neck cohort. That is, it was mostly men. Uh, mean age was 58, 75% uh, men, 80% were current or former smokers, and about 13% had uh, HPV positive tumors. We looked at HPV by several methods, and I'm happy to describe that in more detail. The challenge, of course, in all surgical cohorts, and you require surgical cohorts because you need enough material for whole exome sequencing, is that most HPV tumors are in the oropharynx, and the treatment of most oropharynx cancers is non-operative therapy. So even with the TCGA, as several of you in this room know, we have a relative under-representation of HPV-positive head and neck cancer. But it's a different disease. So it's, there's a significantly lower mutation rate in HPV-positive cancers compared to HPV-negative cancers. These are not the same tumors. In general, when we looked at the entire cohort, the thing that jumped out at everybody and was the title of the companion paper by the Hopkins and Anderson and Baylor group was that there appeared to be notch alterations. And this was unexpected in squamous cell carcinoma, the head and neck. 18 months later, I still can't tell you what the function of these alterations are, so I'm not sure that they're druggable. But what I can tell you is that the most commonly mutated oncogene was PIK3CA. And otherwise, it was a complex story of a couple of known oncogenes and a lot of tumor suppressor genes, and here was the curated list at the time. But we as STAT3 biologists were really interested in trying to see if there was a genetic signature that linked STAT3 hyperactivation to any kind of genetic alteration. So back to basic biology. We and Jackie Bromberg and Jim Darnell and others have sequenced a lot of tumors over the years, and there are no activating mutations of STAT3 in human cancers to our knowledge. The general th thought has been that it's a, con it's a compilation of activation of upstream receptors, such as the EGF receptor, the PDGF receptor, or non-receptors like SARCs and JAKs. But we were wondering if there were really meaningful negative regulatory proteins that by virtue of mutation were inactivated. So we knew about this family of protein tyrosine receptor phosphatases by Bird Vogelstein's paper in Science about five years ago where he reported that there was an unexpectedly high frequency of mutations of these receptors in colon and in lung cancer. And as people further investigated at least PTPRT and PTPRD D, PTP, the STAT3 was shown to be a substrate for these two uh, receptor tyrosine phosphatases. So specifically, these phosphatases dephosphorylate and inactivate STAT3. The role of the other PTPRs has been largely unknown. There's a trickle of papers over time, and almost every paper, at least in the context of cancer, demonstrates that these are tumor suppressor genes, and there's occasional indication that they mediate STAT3 phosphorylation. When we looked back at our cohort, I don't mean, intend for you to look at the details here, but in our 74 patients, we found that PTPRs were mutated in about 33%. Now, with 374 tumors to look at, that is our cohort plus TCGA, it's a little over 40% of human head and neck cancers that appear to have loss of function mutations in the PTPR family. So this may represent an unexpected and common pathway that leads to STAT3 hyperactivation. So this is just a list of the mutations in the two most commonly mutated PTPRs, T and D. And this is where they're located. And I don't mean to spend more time on this except to say that we engage engaged a structural biologist at the University of Pittsburgh in Angela Gronenborn's lab, and it's been really exciting to work with them. The crystal structure of STAT3 has not been reported. We just have STAT3 beta. But based on what we know, what Joseph was able to do is look at all of, this is the region that we expect uh, binds to STAT3. 
and this is where the mutations are. And I think you can appreciate that the phosphotyrosine residue of STAT3 is in very close proximity to most of these mutations. So it seems to be structurally plausible that an inactivating mutation in the region that should, should dephosphorylate STAT3 would lead to failure to dephosphorylate STAT3 and hence hyperactivation. So this has been our central hypothesis that STAT3 hyperactivation, at least in part, results from loss of function mutations in this family, and we can prospectively identify patients who have these mutations and prioritize them for treatment with STAT3 inhibitors as they are developed. So we made the mutations and we put them into head and neck cancer cells. Now I want to emphasize that in conjunction with this, what we did is we created essentially an IL-3 dependent BAF3 analog in head and neck cancer. So you know the BAF3 model has been terrific to screen for oncogenic mutations. You take away the factor IL-3 and if you put a mutation in and it's an oncogene, the cells survive. But there was no such thing for head and neck cancer. So we took an HPV positive and an HPV negative cell line and we made it uh, serum dependent. And so I think you can appreciate that when we put these mutations in, in the absence of serum, we get tremendous increases in survival. So this is a dose-dependent increase in survival when we express this mutant form of PTPRT in a head and neck cancer cell. And there's hyperphosphorylation of STAT3 with this D mutation, hyperphosphorylation of STAT3 with a T mutation. And here is a cucurbitacin, which is a preclinical uh, JAK-STAT inhibitor. And there appears to be enhanced responses to at least this molecule. This, mo this molecule is off target effects and it's not perfect. And then, what in an effort to find more relevant models, we were able over the course of several years to learn from people in other cancers. And what we're now doing is we're taking tumors from patients and we're growing them out as heterotopic tumor grafts in mice. And so these are tumors from patients whose tumors have mutations in these PTPRs. They have hyperactivation of STAT3. And you can see that they have, uh, they respond to treatment in this case by AZD1480, which is a JAK stat inhibitor that's in clinical development. And so we are encouraged that this might represent a plausible model for testing drugs to translate to humans. So this is our idea about a, a clinical trial in a window setting. We would screen patients for mutations. We would enroll them. We would treat them with this JAK stat inhibitor. We would image them before surgery. This is just a few weeks, and they would perform operation. And again, like the decoy trial, see what effect the drug had in the tumor. But we'd have the biomarkers, that is the mutation status, at a, a baseline so we'd know whether or not it was a predictive biomarker. But I also want to remind you that in addition to STAT3, we have this usual suspect. So what does this mean in head and neck cancer? And even though this may not be as innovative a story as PTPRs and STAT3, I think it's really important because what we found is when we looked back, and this is about 165 tumors we've done in collaboration with Gordon Mills and MD Anderson. So basically, we looked at mutation, we looked at gene amplification, and then we looked at reverse phase protein array for expression of proteins that we might hypothesize would be correlated with a PIK3CA mutation or amplification. And what we found is that PIK3C alpha, PIK, PIK, uh, PI3 kinase alpha subunit and phosphorylated forms of AKT were highly correlated, the levels were highly correlated within the tumors that had mutation or amplification. And the, the emerging story is that the frequency of this mutation with HPV negative head and neck cancers is about 15% mutated, another 5% amplified. If it's HPV positive, it's about 30% mutated and another 15% amplified. So it looks like right now, and again, there's only about 50 HPV positive tumors in the TCGA and Pittsburgh cohort, but Tongi Seward from University of Chicago has also looked at HPV positive tumors and found this very high frequency of PIK3CH genomic alterations in HPV positive head and neck cancer. So this could be the predictive biomarker for HPV disease, because quite frankly, in the world of clinical medicine, all we're doing today is we're um, 
dialing down the intensity of treatment for HPV positive disease. We're giving them less chemotherapy or less radiation, but we're not giving them anything that would specifically uh, harness the pathways that are turned on in their tumor. And if one could really cure HPV positive cancer with a PI3 kinase pathway inhibitor or an mTOR inhibitor or something like that, that would be really helpful for this population. So our overall approach has been to create this model that I've showed you with respect to the PTPRT. We have this genomic screening platform. We're now making all of these mutations and putting them into this platform, and then we're looking at drug screening efforts. So here's what we've done with the PIK3CA. This happens to be an HPV-positive model, and you see either amplification or mutation is driving growth, and it's driving signaling, and this is also true in HPV-negative disease. And when we treat with either uh, um, compound, now BEZ235 is a, uh, an mTOR PI3 kinase pathway inhibitor that was developed by Novartis. It's not being further developed because of toxicity. PX866 is a PAN PI3 kinase inhibitor developed by Peter Whiff at, uh, in chemistry at our institution and now being developed in head, neck, and lung. And we're doing a phase two trial supported by Oncothreon. Uh, and we have very similar and compelling data with other PI3 kinase pathway inhibitors. And what I want to emphasize is these are now endogenous mutations. So these cell lines have wild type, and this has mutant, wild type and mutant. So growth inhibition is dramatically enhanced in cell lines that have naturally occurring mutations of PIK3CA. And so here's the bottom line numbers of the numbers of amplification, positive versus negative, and then another 10%, 15% has amplification. So this is where all the mutations are. This is interesting. If you look into the TCGA a cohort, this looks like breast cancer. It's the only other cancer that has mutations throughout the gene. We're not sure what all these mean. So we've made all of these, and we're systematically testing them in our oncogene addiction model. These are previously reported hotspots. They account for about half of the mutations in head and neck cancer. In addition, though, to PIK3CA, I want to emphasize that there are mutations in other genes in the PI3 kinase pathway, a handful of the other uh, PI3 kinases, as well as mTOR. So these are the agents, a couple of the agents that we're looking at. All of them are either approved or in clinical development, and we're trying to determine whether targeting at different nodes in the pathway is more or less effective in conjunction with a specific mutation. And perhaps most excitingly for us is this is now our heterotopic tumor graph model. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this slide. So this is a patient whose tumor had a PIK3CA mutation, and they're HPV positive. And when we treated mice with this tumor, with the BEZ compound, they went away. So the tumors disappeared if the, because, the, and, and this tumor was PIK3CA uh, mutant and HPV positive. In contrast, a tumor that had low phosphorylate AKT, this is a patient's tumor, PIK3CA wild type, didn't have very much of a response to this PI3 kinase pathway inhibitor. This patient's tumor was HPV negative, but had high phosphorylated AKT and a mutation, and it also had a dramatic response. So what we think, it, what we believe is that if we could assay patients either for the mutation, or even you can, you can see, you can just look at phosphorylated of AKT, and it's a very nice surrogate marker for activation of the pathway. These, this test can simply be used to enrich of uh, clinical trial populations so that we're giving patients that have tumors like this drugs that are effective, and we don't force patients that have tumors like this to suffer the toxicity and delay effective treatment because they're probably not going to respond. So in collaboration with the University of Chicago and Tongi Seward's group, we are uh, doing a phase two clinical trial. In this case, we're using the Novartis compound, the BKM120, which is a pan pi 3 kinase inhibitor. This is a recurrent metastatic setting, and the key thing is biopsy. So baseline biopsy, biopsy after single agent, biopsy after the addition of cetuximab. The reason for the addition of cetuximab because it's real-world clinical medicine and this is FDA approved in this setting and it would be really difficult to get this through uh, IRBs without the opportunity to retreat with cetuximab. We have modest clinical evidence uh, or preclinical evidence that this is far more effective than PI3 kinase pathway targeting alone. But we at least hope in the context of sequencing and fish on all of these specimens that we really can begin to test these hypotheses, hypotheses to really broadly apply uh, more commonly. 
So in summary, I think I want to emphasize that understanding both the signaling mechanisms of any model disease, whether it be head, neck, cancer, or otherwise, but also look at the basic biology. It's daunting, it's overwhelming, it's confusing. Most of these mutations are passengers, they're not drivers. But if we just begin to put our understanding of biology and the enormous uh, data resources that are being delivered by the TCGA, we may be able to quickly identify mechanisms of resistance as well as new targets, Patient specimens and relevant preclinical models are really critical in this effort. The theme so far is that signaling through alternative her family receptors and alternative downstream signaling pathways may be helpful in the setting of Tuxmab resistance, which quite frankly we're seeing more and more. And there's many, many therapies in the early stages of development. We can't possibly look at them all in a systematic way or we'll run out of time. So I think the challenge is to really begin to hypothesize what are the features in the patient's tumor that should predict which of these therapies they should receive. And I'll stop by saying I don't get to do anything except come here and have a wonderful time. There's the group in Pittsburgh, clearly the TCGA, and my, group, and my colleagues at other institutions, as well as my collaborators at the Broad, and lots of uh, resources from uh, the NCI and the NIH. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grandis, uh, for a wonderful tour through a lot of interesting pathways and potential actions. So we have time for questions. Dr. O'Shea. Hey, how are hey. you? Hey, good to see you. you Great too. talk. You're not, you're not <laughs> playing rock music. <laughs> uh, Francis didn't ask me today. Oh, well, there you go. Next time. Um, Next time. I, I have heard him. <laughs> but I will at, at, at any time. Um, so in our business, we've debated back and forth the relative merits of blocking at high points in the pathway with jacks or downstream with the stats. And, yeah. and there's reasonable arguments for both. Yeah. Um, so sort of a two-part question. Um, in patients who don't have the PIK3C uh, uh, mutation, do right. you see activation of AKT suggesting that there's autocrine production of cytokines that could be activating this pathway? Absolutely. And then, you know, it, even though maybe it doesn't make any sense to target both jacks and stats, do mm -hmm. you, have you ever dumped both of those things into an assay to see, yeah. do you get synergy in any way? Yeah, that's a really good question. So you know, John, all the jack inhibitors block stats, right? So, but, but also secondarily, block, it's, it's, lots it's, of other things, right? They block other things, right. too. So like it's basically AKT. belt and suspenders, right? So if we block stat downstream of jack plus through another mechanism, is there any benefit to that? And the answer is we haven't tried, and the challenge has been either using molecular strategy like siRNA, which is not particularly effective phenotypically, as you know. It's great as a tool. Um, but we haven't tried the decoy in conjunction with the JAK inhibitor, and that probably makes sense to do. The HPV positive patients have a much better prognosis, right? They are easier to treat, almost 80 uh, percent. Don't you think the pic 3 ca therapy would be more effective for the non-HPV patients, given the fact they are Well, you know, it's really interesting. I've now heard this um, in many settings, most recently in a summary statement. <laughs> Why bother studying HPV-positive head and neck cancer? It's all cured. And I can tell you that as a clinician, and I think the clinicians in the room can tell you, there's not a week that goes by in tumor board that we don't see an HPV-positive recurrent tumor. So in general, these patients have a better prognosis than HPV negative disease. But there are still patients with HPV positive disease that recur. And the question is, are these the patients? Is this the 30 to 40 percent with pic 3 ca mutations? And the answer is we don't know yet because they haven't been systematically studied. So you're right. You know, the targeting pic 3 ca mutations will have impact in both the space of HPV positive head and neck cancer and HPV negative pet, head and neck cancer. I was meeting with uh, Pat Moore and Yuan Chang this week, really trying to understand, I'm not a virologist, what is it about human papillomavirus infection of the aerodigestive tract that would essentially pre predispose to selection of alterations in this gene, whether it be amplification or mutation. And the disappointment, of course, is that it's not only in HPV positive cancer, it's in negative cancers too. So I think that it's going to be a complicated story, but worth considering in both spaces. So do the HPV positive patients have P53 mutations? Never. Never. I should, is that fair to say? Virtually never. At least in the TCJ, we haven't found, in 370 some cases, we haven't found a single case of P53 
P53-mutant and HPV-positive. Now, again, that's 30-some cases there, and then we have another, um, you know, 12 from R. So it's a relatively small number, but I think that uh, to date there's probably been maybe 100 HPV-positive tumors that have been sequenced and that none of them, to my knowledge, have a P53 mutation. Thanks. I'm going to follow up on John O'Shea's question. Yeah. In several examples now of molecular targeting, you do well for a while and then you escape. Absolutely. And so why not already go to a strategy in which you actually look at the network connectivity here and see where the likely bypass pathways are and do combinatorial treatment right up front rather than going down and yeah. letting everybody escape and then trying yeah. to catch up with it? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great idea. So I think there's two obstacles, none of which are uh, necessarily impossible to overcome. Number one is to have models that are relevant to human beings with cancer to understand the escape mechanisms. And right now, I think our cell lines in, are imperfect, and I think we have to really perfect potentially these heterotopic tumor graphs, getting them from both primaries and recurrences, ideally the same patients, and growing them and seeing if we can understand the resistance mechanisms for targeting. That's number one. The second challenge, which we have been able to overcome, but it's not trivial, is that sometimes your ideal cocktail is manufactured by different drug companies. And we all recognize this and we all try to deal with it, but it sometimes proves really challenging to get everybody in the same room, particularly at the end of the day when we don't necessarily have an economic argument for why they should do this. If it's a very small population of a relatively uncommon cancer, it doesn't get their attention. So. I recognize that as a challenge that I'm perfectly happy to take on, but it does at some point mean that our toolkits for our preclinical models sometimes have to be modified when we go to the clinic because engaging the people who have the drugs that we can give to people is so difficult on levels that are not scientific. But Francis is going to solve that, right? Uh, well, it is certainly <laughs> not just unique to this situation, no. <laughs> but in so many other circumstances but probably cancer particularly, where you'd like to do combination trials because you know from everything we've learned in how we've succeeded in curing things like leukemia and lymphoma that single agents is generally not going to do it. And we know that for HIV AIDS. Why would we think uh, that it would be true yeah. in some of these very difficult to treat cancers? And yet there are all these barriers, some of which relate to commercial uh, in, in situations, some of which are regulatory. Uh, it is a major topic of discussion in, in the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, but I would not tell you that we have the answer quite yet. So Jennifer, hi. hi. I was just wondering whether you could give me a feel for um, what percentage of the tumors have both activated STAT and activated PI3 kinase, aka T pathways? Yeah, that's so it depends on how you measure it. And um, I think that the best way of figuring that out right now is through the RPPA data of TCGA. And I don't believe that all that data has been uploaded and publicly available. We have a couple of heat maps that are coming out. The paper right now is, is being written. And the answer is going to be um, not everybody <laughs> and not necessarily the same tumors. It does look, at least preliminarily, that the activated AKT and the activated PSTAT3 are not the same subgroup, but that's not always true. So I will, when that data is locked in and uh, finalized, I will let you know. Great. Yeah, so somewhat more general question. In, in uh, your last slide where you talked about the design of your clinical trial, you referred to serial biopsies. Yeah. And, uh, and it sort of reminds me of serial imaging. How, how important is that tool in general going to be to, as a strategy to a yeah. kind of dealing with these That's a great diseases? question. There was just a really lovely editorial, I think it was in clinical cancer research, about the, uh, somebody uh, did a study that was really illuminating about the number of um, uh, studies that were uh, reported at like the AECR or ASCO that reported to have correlative biomarkers and then when you looked at the publication you know only 10 percent of them ever reported correlative biomarkers which meant that people were collecting material and either doing nothing with it or more likely all the data were negative so they weren't putting it into the publication and so I think that it, it reminds me that you have to have a question 
that you're asking in order to interrogate the biospecimen. So I think, it, from my perspective, the most meaningful thing is what happens in the context of treatment resistance. So if you biopsy a patient at baseline and then you give them a drug and nothing happens, nothing happens, and then that tumor grows. It's really important to understand what's happening in that tumor, and that's been really elegantly shown by Jeff Engelman and others at Mass General, really elucidating novel mechanisms of uh, treatment resistance. So I think that if you have the context, it's really important to do this. And the second thing is high quality tissue is really challenging to get, particularly if you're talking about a fine needle aspiration or an inter-office setting, and it requires a team and a commitment. And frankly, I think it also really requires that we educate the patient and engage them at our, as our partners because it's not clear to them that it's going to benefit them. And it's usually inconvenient and sometimes it's uncomfortable and depending on the context of the study it may or may not be compensated and especially if we're talking about going back to the operating room. So I think we've paid an enormous amount of lip service to serial biopsies and I think that they're critically important, but you have to be asking an important question that when you answer it with that biopsy, it'll change what you do next. And I don't think we always think that through. Well, these have been wonderful uh, questions and answers, and uh, we will have a reception now in the library with some refreshments. If you have further discussion you'd like to have with our speaker, please come, or please come anyway. And uh, let us one more time thank our Pittman lecturer, Dr. Brandis. Oh. Thank you. Thank you so much for staying. Oh, it is very interesting.